Welcome to the webinar on scheduling for elementary schools and small schools. Hello, my name is Elaine Boyd and I will be the instructor today. In this webinar, we will be covering the following topics. What data to roll over to the new school year? Tables that are needed to build a student schedule. How to put in or enter in the student course requests scheduling reports, scheduling operations. As you can see, I am in my MMS generations and creating a new school year is done in generations. To do this, you need to have access to the admin menu and we are going to go to school year maintenance. Now we do have a tech byte on running this specific operation as well as a, an entire webinar on getting ready for the new school year. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but I do need to create my new school year. So I'm going to do uh, two examples. I'm going to do my high school and I'm going to do an elementary school. And so I had, you can see my district database. I have my high school, my current school year, and it is going to go to my two school, which is also the high school, and my 17-18 school year. Now I am going to auto select my default tables, but there are some tables that I am going to deselect. Actually, I'm going to start at the top and work my way down. If you see any table that has a uh, student in its name with the exception of the student master file, you want to make sure that that is deselected. Um, now what you roll over also depends on when you are rolling over your school year. Now if you plan on making use of the online course registration, you're going to want to create that new school year before your current school year ends so that your students can go online and register for the courses that they want for the new school year. Some elementary schools don't think about scheduling until the current year is closed. So um, remember that as I'm going through and selecting or deselecting certain tables. Now we are going to select the course section table. Because you are either an elementary school or a small school, I am making the assumption that you are not going to use the automated schedule builder and start with a brand new section table each school year. Um, as most elementary schools, I could almost say all elementary schools, roll over their section table and they make minor adjustments and same is true for small high schools or middle schools. They keep the same master schedule for the most part from year to year and they don't start from scratch each year. So with my control key pressed down I'm going to click on course section table. We do want that to carry forward and because my current month right now is January, there are some tables that I don't want to carry over because we're not done using them in the current school year. So they are student tables that do get carried over. Most of these are just my code tables, so I do want them to carry forward. It is the health information. Now health information really should not be carried over until the school year has closed because nurses probably right up into the last hour of the last day of the, your current school year is going to be entering in data still or the potential is there. These don't start with the word student but they contain the, wor the word student. So these are specific health tables that the nurses are still entering in data for. Now if you're not using our health system then there is no need to deselect those tables. This is a table that's not part of the auto select default, but at some point in time you're, you will probably want to move that table over even though it's not part of the auto select default. And this is the parent student portal table. So this is the settings 
that you create when you in in MMS generations when you set up what information you want the parents and students to see in their portal so I am going to select that one I want that there these student tables are all information or data that needs to stay with the current school year You'll want to carry forward the student in internet password table as well as the student master table. And everything else should be fine. Now before we go ahead and hit process, uh, there is an option here to move forward all students regardless of the current filter and the current filter should be all active students. I, For, mo for the most part you don't want to roll over inactive students. They're not active in your school right now and you probably don't want them in your new school year. But we do want to take a look at our teacher range. If there are any teachers that are long gone and you don't know who they are or they have left for a while, you can deselect them here and not bring them forward to your new school year. Just a, a word of warning for schools in the state of Pennsylvania. If these teachers are current for the 16-17 school year but you know they're retiring or they're leaving at the end of the school year you still need to carry them forward for reporting purposes. I'm going to leave all my teachers intact and the next we're going to take a look at is the student range and here we don't want our graduating seniors to come to the new school year. So we're going to sort this by year of graduation so just clicking on that year of grad column, I'm going to type in 2018 and I should have deselected everybody first and now I'm going to select and hold my control key down and that's going to select 2018 on down and we should be good. So you just want to make sure that you exclude those students that are leaving you. We're going to click OK and then we are going to process. Okay, so now I'm going to go to my middle school and I'm going to take those graduating 8th graders because I need them in my new school year, especially if I'm going to do online course registration. So I'm going to pull from my middle school, my current school year, and I'm going to bring it to my high school for the 17-18 school year. And looking at my cheat sheet, I want year of grad of 2021. That is what I'm looking for. At this point, we are not going to auto-select the default tables. We don't want to do that. We are just looking for the student master table. And that student master table is going to get our contact tables as well as the three master file tables. We do need a student range and let's see what we have for students here. So my 2020 shouldn't be there so we're going to start with deselect and we're looking just for our 2021 um, so I typed in 2021 and that's going to bring me to my first 8th grader I'm going to hold down my control key, click on Kara, and now I'm going to type in 2022. And I'm going to hold down my control key and click on Robert. And now I only have the 169 students that are going to be my incoming freshman class. And we are going to click OK. And in all of this, we are using just the transfer records. So I'm going to process. Very important to read this alert. It is going to spell out very clearly what you are doing, the school that you are either pulling from or pulling to, sending to, and the school years. When you stop reading these and just click yes, as soon as you click yes, that's when you're going to realize that you've made a mistake. Click OK. So the next 
uh, next transfer that I'm going to do is my elementary school. And elementary is going to be very much the same as what we did for the high school. So it's going to go East Elementary to East Elementary, 1617 to 1718. I am going to do my auto select default tables. And I am going to go to the top and I am going to do my attendance, no, not my attendance calendar table. I want to do my course section table. I am going to go down and remove the health tables. Holding down my control key, clicking on these tables will deselect them. And there is five of those. And I am going to do the the portal. And likewise, teachers, I'm not going to pull any, well, I no, I, I do need to review my teachers, just like with my high school. And everybody is all set. And I am going to do my student range. We're going to sort and we're going to deselect everybody. So my oldest students are my 2013s and 2023s. Oh my goodness. And so I'm going to type in 2024. And so everybody from there on down, I want to select. And these are my students that are going to be moving over to my middle school. We don't want them to pull forward. Now, when you are rolling over your data, if you do know that there's a student that's going to be joining you for another year, you can select them and move them over. But it's very easy to bring them back forward um, if, if you don't pull them forward at right at this point for the scheduling. Click OK, and we are going to process. All right, so now that we have our new school year and we're ready to schedule, one thing that you can do that is a wonderful tip, I'm going to exit out of here, is what you can do is create a user account strictly for scheduling or if you are in that scheduling window, you can um, change it so that your default school year is the 17-18 school year. I am notorious for when I get into my database, it'll default to the current school year, and I tend not to pay attention to that, even when I should. And if you are in the scheduling mode, another thing that uh, other schools do is that they create a user account called Scheduler. And when they know they're going to be working on scheduling tasks, they log in using that account. All right, I am going to bring you to the staff portal right now and we're going to pull up the student schedule editor. And I just quickly want to go over the tables that go into making up a student schedule. So if I come to my students menu and go to either directly to the schedule editor or the student profile, that's going to get me to the student schedule. And if I scroll down, there we go, I can see Amy's schedule here. So just by looking at her schedule, I can see the course name, a course code, the section that she is in for all of her classes. The term, the length of term of the course, uh, most of her courses that we see here are year long. We can see the days of the week that the course meets, the periods that it meets, the teacher, the room that it is held in. And by looking at this also, I can see that she has several classes here that she has not been scheduled into. But all of these tables all go into, uh, what we've seen here, all goes into creating 
a student schedule. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at these, but I think it's important to have a good foundation as to what tables you need to address. All right, so I'm going to flip back to my MMS generations. And the first thing that I want to point out, and it's more just for you to be aware of what is available. Most people who have access to MMS don't necessarily have access to the database configuration. But there are things that you can configure that will be unique to your school in regards to scheduling. So this is, and this is actually also available in the, in the staff portal. I keep forgetting that. Um, so you can see how many days that are in your cycle. Mine is a typical five day cycle. And for each day we need to have a unique one, one character label for it. So a lot of high schools have, a, you know, a red day, a black day, A day, B day type schedule. You can determine how long you want your course codes to be. It can be up to 12 characters. Section codes can be up to four characters. Um, we're not going to address study halls in this webinar. We do have a separate webinar on, schedule, uh, on scheduling study halls, so I recommend that you watch that. So how many periods are you going to have per day? Elementary schools, not so much worried about, you know, students changing from period to period. Um, they tend to stay in the same room with the same teacher. So that is, uh, I've seen elementary schools schedules where everything was period one, <laughs> and, you know, and that's fine. High schools, it's a little bit different because students are changing classrooms. Do you want to apply schedule rotation? Um, we're not going to really get into rotation here. In this session. We do have some uh, knowledge base articles on rotation though. So if you're looking for more information, by all means, look those up. And then tracking section entry and exit dates, uh, you don't, not necessarily something that deals directly with scheduling your students. We have our students, we've rolled those over. Well, students need to meet in a classroom. So we do have a room table, and that is found under the school menu and edit rooms. Now, if you are using our discipline module, you will have some rooms in here that are not necessarily there for a class to meet. It is more for recording where a discipline event happened. For example, I have a room called bus, and that is when something a student does something either on the ride to or the ride from school on the school bus. Uh, because of that, we, we do have that omit from scheduling. Now that is primarily used for when you are using the automated schedule builder, but if you are tabulating free time or free times for rooms, you'll want to admit, omit that from scheduling, and I do believe that will do that if you have that checked. Set constraints is only used for uh, the automated schedule builder, and we are not going to this is scheduling without using the ASB. To add a room, you click on the plus sign and it'll bring up a, a window and it'll allow you to enter in the new room code. And then you can put in a description. A lot of schools will put in the teacher's name if teachers generally are working out of one classroom. Or they'll put in that it's the art room, music room, etc. To delete a room, um, all you have to do is select the room and the red X. If the room is used in any of the tables, it will let you know and it will not delete the room. There are times when MMS will delete something even though it's been 
use. But for scheduling, we're pretty protective of that data. So we have students, we have rooms, we'll get to courses in a minute, but we need teachers to teach the, the classes. So back under school management jobs, we have two areas where we can see teacher information. We have Edit Staff Basic and Edit Staff Expanded. For scheduling purposes, Edit Staff Basic will give us the information that we need. Just to follow up, the room table is only accessed through MMS Generations and likewise with the teacher information at this point. Both of those are only accessed through MMS Generations. So if you have the teachers taking attendance in a homeroom setting, you need to make sure that for that teacher's um, data that you have the homeroom listed here. A, if you have a somebody in your staff table, say for example, if I do a locate, I have some wonderful examples here. We have a probation officer who is not a teacher. We have a truancy officer. We have state police. And I do believe we have a bus driver and a janitor. So those, so if I click on my janitor, oh, that should be set as a non-instructional staff member. Homeschool, if you have teachers, especially if you are a multiple school database, a teacher that, and you have a teacher that teaches in more than one building, so say for example, they teach in the middle school as well as the high school, they can only have one home school. So they will be in both schools staff table, but only one of those records for that teacher can have and should have that home school checked on there. With the exception of the home room and making sure that non-instructional staff members are checked here, this is all you really need to do for your basic scheduling. Time constraints, quick course constraints, room constraints, and departments all apply to the automated schedule builder. And since we have rolled our data over, we know that the teachers that we have in our teacher table are valid teachers. Uh, we don't have to worry about anybody being in there that is no longer available, with the exception of Pennsylvania. One more area in the school management jobs, and I really should be in my new school year, is that we want to go to our edit scheduling term definitions. And that is found under the school job and edit scheduling term definitions. Now, once the school year starts, and actually this is pulled into the section table. We, uh, before the school year starts, I don't necessarily have to do this now, but I need to make sure at some point in time that I have start date and end dates entered in for all of the terms that I'm going to be using. Now, this is a good time that if you, uh, for example, for an elementary school, if you only have full year classes, nothing is offered as a as a term only or a semester only, you can delete all of those terms that you are not using. I do believe in my high school database I do have some quarter long classes so I can't delete those. But my elementary school, um, I know I don't use those. Everything is a full year. We'll want to put in the appropriate grade plan for the term and check 
the terms that you want to use for tracking free time and that would be more for creation of study halls. And I am going to get this warning message until I put in my dates. And that's fine. I'm not ready to put in dates yet. The next area we're going to look at is our edit course catalog. And I'm actually going to go to the staff portal for that. And I'm going to switch to my elementary school. All right. So the dates are important for the staff, for any of the portals. So I am going to keep getting those, those uh, messages. The course catalog is found under Manage and in Editing Jobs, Edit Course Catalog. And you just need to review your, the, the courses that are here and make sure that uh, if there are any courses that you are no longer offering or any courses that you are going to be offering which are new for the for your new school year that you add them in here they need to be in the course catalog before you can create a section on them and we do have a report that you can run I am a paper person and I like to have those lists on a piece of paper so I can make notes and you do have access to that to print that off and verify that everything that you need offered is there. The course sequence data and the course schedule constraints are not needed for are only used for the automated schedule builder so we will not be looking at those. The next area that we're going to look at is our edit course sections. And again, what, what you want to do um, is to print off the six, section listing and make sure that the staff assignments and the room assignments are still what you need. Um, once the, the student schedule requests have been in and we run some reports on that, then you can make adjustments to increasing or dec decreasing the number of sections that you have. Generally with small schools the, the population isn't building and generally what you have is going to ac accommodate what you um, have had in the past. Looking at charter high schools their population is limited and they can only allow so many students per grade level uh, because of their limited size so they generally don't fluctuate a lot with their their core classes as to what they offer and the amount of sections that they need per per course. So it's very important that this is all set up before you start scheduling. Alright so now that we have our I'm going to flip back to my MMS generations and now that we have our tables needed for scheduling. We have our room table, our section table, our teachers, our staff, and our courses. We're ready to start scheduling our students. And there are several ways that you can do that. For high schools and maybe some middle schools, depending on any electives that the students may be taking, you can initiate the online course registration where the students can go online, select their own classes uh, with guidance that you put in for it you know, as part of setting up the online course registration and they can select their own classes and then you can import them in and the requests will be waiting for you. They won't be scheduled into specific sections but they will have all of their requests there. And we do have a tech bite, actually two tech bites, on how to set up online course registration as well as how to import that data into MMS. So we will leave that there. But just to tout the benefits of online course registration, it allows the students to select any courses that they may be able to take. 
It also gives the parents the chance to get involved in helping and guiding and being part of the process of the students selecting their courses. It saves time on the part of the school staff. They don't have to do the data entry. The students are doing it for them. And just to refresh that we do have some tech bytes on how to set that up. Now before we get into doing any of the mass edit, if you choose to enter in the student course request yourself, before you start that, strongly recommend that you use filters. Filters, and I do have some set up. So I have five filters set up so that I am filtering on a specific grade level. And that will hopefully be apparent once we start getting into the mass edit, which is the first option that we're going to take a look at. So the mass edit student course records is found under scheduling jobs, operations, mass edit student course records. This operation gives you several different options here. I can see here that I can add a course and for all of the students that I either am filtered on or I do have the option of selecting a student range, I can select that they are going to take art, English, and a math class. Select my student range and process. So these students will have a request for art, English, and math, but they won't be scheduled into a specific section. We have this lovely reset button, so it will, whichever tab you are on, it will clear it out for you. Rather than just giving a student art, I am going to take my group of students that I know are all going to be in the same classroom together and schedule them so that they all have the same section. They all have the same teacher for all of their courses. Now that works well for those core classes that they're going to have for the same teacher. You could mix it up for the, the phys ed or the art, but generally those students travel together in a pack. They're not going to be broken up and mixed in with uh, the other first grade class. Or there may be just one first grade class. So for elementary schools, you are going to more than likely select the course and section that the student will be enrolled into for high schools. So you can see I've selected section one for all of these. For high schools, you probably, um, the students, you know, move around and mix. They don't travel in packs together. So you can give them the option of intermingling with their whole class, grade level, and not, you know, being able to give them a little bit more variety in how they're scheduled. So if you choose to put them directly into their section. Again, I would recommend using a student filter and not using the student range. That way you don't have to worry and you know exactly which group of students you're working with. Click on process edits and all of those students will be scheduled into their class and you're done. Short of reviewing the class list, making sure that everybody has all of the the courses that they need for the for the new school year, you're done. This operation will also drop courses from a student schedule and you can select just the course code or you can be specific and select the course section. You can do a, re, a, a course replace so if you accidentally put a group of students into a section or a course and it should have been, uh, for example, your first graders got put into a second grade math, 
you can set your filter so it's only first grade students and then replace the course of second grade math with the course of first grade math. And for each course that you want to change, you need to fill out both of those columns. You can do a conditional add. So for all students who are in my Section 1 English, I'm going to add them to Section 1 Math, Section 1 Science, so forth. You can do a conditional drop and you can do an edit condition. So this is an additional layer of filtering that you can do on the students that will be processed. When you are doing your mass editing, have a checklist and this time I would strongly recommend printing it out and know exactly which students you're processing and be in a room with the door closed with no interruptions. It's very easy to get lost as to where you are exactly and if you start adding same courses to the same group of students or the wrong courses to the wrong students it's, it can be fixed but it's better to be cautious and careful and not have to back out of any errors made. So like I said, if you are entering in the course sections, you're done at that point. If you chose to only add the courses, then you still need to schedule your students. Now I did talk about filters and how I created a filter. We do have a webinar on creating filters, which I highly recommend. Filters are wonderful and they are useful for all aspects of MMS and not just scheduling. So I do recommend that you watch that, that webinar if you are unfamiliar with filters. All right, we do have another operation that I think is rather cool and it is scheduling. Fund under more schedule editing jobs and it is enter initial course requests. This operation works one student at a time so you can see, so that's a student editor. I can see the student that I'm working with. I'm working with Jacqueline Abatici, who is sister to the famous Amy Abatici, who is in all of our demo databases. And again, we have the option of adding the course or adding the course section. And then here we can select alternates. Now alternates will only be allowed if the course is set up in the course catalog to allow alternates to be selected. This wouldn't happen necessarily in an elementary school, but it would happen in a high school. Say, for example, a student selected a um, robotics class that's very popular and the demand exceeds the availability. So some of those students that select robotics are not going to get into robotics. So robotics would be a class that you would allow alternates to be selected. Now alternates can be entered manually through here or they can be, um, if you have online course registration, the students can select alternates as part of that. All right, so I did put in art and computers for Jacqueline and I can leave it there or I can run the partial scheduler and the partial scheduler will look for availabilities and keeping those default settings are, are fine. We click on process and it will see whether it can schedule the students in. It updates the class enrollment and now we can see that a, uh, Jacqueline has been put into section 2 of art and section 2 of computers. Let's go to another student that doesn't have anything scheduled and we could go into our select section and put him into section 1 of art, section 1 of computers, conduct and effort, English and I am purposely keeping him all into section one 
so that he will be um, knowing which class he's going to be in. And as soon as I hit save, those requests go there. And there's no need to run the partial scheduler because he is already scheduled into the sections. This option is really nice for if you use the mass edit, schedule everybody in, and then you have a student who comes to you after the, the schedules have already been created. So a new student coming into your school, and this is really quick one way of being able to schedule them all into their classes. It can be done in the student schedule editor, but this one is much faster. If you don't have, if you are not licensed for scheduling, we do have these options, some options available through grades because being able to enter grades is great only if they're scheduled into classes. So you don't have access to the automated schedule builder and that wealth of tools and reports, but through grade reporting, you have under editing jobs, you have the initial enter initial course requests so that individual editor is there for you and also under grade reporting you have under operations you have the mass edit student course records and in both of those cases you are going to want to add the course section well, actually, the individual one, you still had access to the partial scheduler, but in this one, uh, you do not have access to any scheduler, so you will want to select the course and section. If you are in a high school and you have allowed for online course registration and you want to know whether you need to make any adjustments to your section table, to make sure that you have enough courses and sections for the student requests. Under scheduling, we're going to take a look at a report that will give you the information that you need. So under more scheduling reports, we are going to go to the course requests tally report. Now we could do the course request list by student or by course, but this tally report will let us know how many classes, how many students have selected each course. Um, all right, so we'll, we're not going to have much here, but we are going to have some since I did run those. So for my art, for my first and second grades, I have a total of two students that have selected this. So this just gives you, um, you know how many students can fit in each classroom, how many students per section, and by looking at that course total number, you'll know whether you have enough sections or if you have too many sections and you need to reduce the size or the number of sections. The other reports we are going to look at after we do some scheduling. So if you did not, uh, mass edit your students into a specific section of a class, then you have some scheduling to do. So under scheduling, we do have that course request tally report here in the staff portal as well. So we're not going to use any of the automated schedule builder operations, but there are two schedulers that we can use that assumes that the section table is in place. And the first one we're going to look at is the student scheduler. Now all of our schedulers have this similar setup here. There are three options that you can allow, um, that you can select. One is semester balance. Semester balance applies to courses that are not a full year in length, so they are either a quarter long or a semester long. And what MMS will do is as it's building the student schedule, if they have, uh, if you have departments associated with the, the courses and the course catalog, if you have two electives and they're both from the English department, balance out those courses from the same department. Course sequencing, we don't need to pay any attention to that, that 
deals with um, constraints that you put in for the automated schedule builder and then allowing overloads so I would leave that checked initially and that will show you that you know maybe you need to increase the the number of sections offered uh, for a particular class if you have the availability to have two sections running concurrently MMS does its best to not create overloads that's important to remember it, it won't take the easy way out it will try to build the the sections evenly minimum number of scheduling attempts per student I have never seen that changed um, that is a good number if it can't schedule a student after a hundred thousand attempts then there's probably not any way that with the current data that you have that that student will get scheduled and we do have two different reports that you have access to and with all of our reports you can enter in your own user defined report title and they are right there and there you do have access to a student range or you can pull down and um, and use your filter if you want either way is fine where a student range might come in handy not so much for elementary schools but more for high schools for those elective classes if you want to give preference to your seniors to get into those high demand elective classes because this is their one shot of getting in before they graduate you can set your student range so you you schedule the students the seniors first rather than the freshmen one thing that the the student scheduler will do is it will unschedule all courses and reschedule the courses to make the best possible schedule for a student so if a student was partially scheduled and you run the student scheduler if they are in that student range then they will be pulled from all of the sections that they're currently enrolled in and then MMS will try to get the the best schedule for that student in the section table you can set a priority uh, a priority of normal or low and MMS will schedule the normal priorities before the low priorities so that is something that would be important to go back and review and make sure that the core classes are set to a normal priority and the elective classes set to a low priority that way when you run this you don't stand the chance of a student losing an English class for a family consumer science although a very useful class teaching life skills is very important they may not need family consumer science to graduate but they will need their English class so process does process and you are going to get a a warning message saying that you are running the student scheduler for the 2017-18 school year are you sure you want to execute yes and in my high school I don't think I have anything here and I am right I have 435 students and I have 435 students without any courses the other scheduler that you will want to use is the partial scheduler just like the student scheduler you need to have the the student uh, the, st the section table needs to be in place it will not create sections for you but what this one the partial scheduler will do is it will not unschedule or change the section assignments for any previously scheduled courses whereas the student schedule unscheduled the student and then started fresh this one will only try to schedule those sections of which the student hasn't been scheduled into yet the other operation that you will want to do periodically while you are doing the scheduling process is to update class enrollments those are the reports and this will take your section table and update that information with the actual enrollment for your students
Now one thing I didn't talk about before I went into the different schedulers is checkpoints. Now checkpoints are right here. You can create a checkpoint also in MMS Generations. A checkpoint is wonderful. It does a mini backup. There are nine tables, the course catalog, section table, teachers, rooms, departments, section patterns, terms, and student schedule records, and it will create a mini backup. Now we here at MMS do, if you are a hosted school, we do backups of your data every night, but in order to restore a backup, it's all of the tables and it's not immediate. It takes, it takes some time for us to do that request for you. A checkpoint, it's all in your hands. You can create and restore from a checkpoint. When you do restore from a checkpoint, it's all of those nine tables. So any changes that you made to any of those tables that you want to restore a backup from, a checkpoint from, all of those tables are going to get restored to that to that point in time that you saved. Now you can create up to 26 checkpoints in a day. When you create a new checkpoint here in the staff portal, it automatically puts the date and time. You can see that right here. Time I don't think is that important. What is important is the description that you enter in there. You need to be very specific as to where you are in the scheduling process. If you look at the name of the checkpoint, you can see here, oh, this is the one I just created the most recently, was 12-22-16-A. So this was created on December 22, 2016, and A indif indicates that this was the first checkpoint of the day created that day. It goes up to Z. I haven't tried what happens if you go beyond Z. So I you know, I kept the time in there, but uh, you are limited. You have quite a bit of room in the description, but it's not never ending, so you are limited. I would definitely start a checkpoint at, at different points. Um, you can do it day by day. The only problem with a checkpoint file is not creating enough of them. So they are a wonderful time saver to restore a checkpoint. There's separate operations and generations to create, one to create and one to restore. Here they're all in one operation. So if I wanted to restore this one, I could. And I can see the school year that it's restoring to. To delete a checkpoint file, you can only do that through the staff portal. So you just click on the X and that will so I can delete that one and yes. And this is something that you'll want to, it's part of keeping your database healthy, is every checkpoint is adding to your database and the bigger your database gets, the slower it gets. So you want to make sure that once you're done with the scheduling process, definitely make that last checkpoint so you have it there um, as a security blanket, <laughs> but you but the other ones you can probably delete. Checkpoint files also give you the ability to save where you are and then try something completely different. If that doesn't work out, then you can always go back to where you were before. So it gives you a lot of freedom in scheduling to answer the questions, gee, I wonder what would happen if, and you can try. And it's a, a no harm, no foul kind of thing. All right, so let's go back to some of the reports that you can do. Uh, once your student schedules are all set, under scheduling, we can print out our class lists. This would probably be regular only, and you would select the week, so that is the, the term. So I have four weeks available, so if I wanted to print out class lists for a course that only meets during quarter four, I would have to select that one and we're just going to go with, and it's one term at a time, and we can select the term code. So we can do um, 
just for full year classes, um, semester classes, where this is not a student schedule, this is just for a specific class that we're going to be printing that off. You build your lists and select the courses that you want and you do have some some report preferences that you can run. And this is also available in MMS Generations. Same report, just the setup looks a little bit different. The other one I want to do is the print student schedules which is available both in MMS Generations and in the Staff Portal. And you have two different styles. You have the grid style and a line style. The line style you can do the full year schedule if there are differences between semesters and terms. The grid style you can only do um, one term at a time. So if you have um, a combination of semesters and quarters, you would have to print out the student's grid style schedule for each term. And you do have some, some options here. At any point, you can click on Help, and Help will bring up where you are in MMS, and it will walk you through how to, what the report will do for you, and how to generate that report set it up. And new for 4.6 is when you see these books and they look colorful, that means there is a knowledge base article that has been linked to student schedules. Now we don't have it linked to all of our knowledge base currently, but we are starting to uh, use the knowledge base more. So if I go to my student schedule editor, watch the books. Now also available are the teacher schedules and teacher master schedule that you can print off. And again you have two options between the teacher schedules and the teacher master schedules, which options you want to include, and you can set a start period, stop period range for what you want to include in the scheduling. Well, I hope you found this information useful. Scheduling obviously does happen on a small school or elementary school basis, and I think we tend to pay a lot of attention to the automated schedule builder, but there are many different tools within MMS to help you create the schedules to meet the students' needs. Thank you.